This podcast is brought to you by VinZero. VinZero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit VinZero.com to learn more about how organisations design, build and solve through digitalisation. From VinZero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. Subscribe to VinZero Think Future for access to more episodes, interviews and profiles. Aidan Mullen is the Sustainability Manager for Interface in Australia and New Zealand. Aidan specialises in the commercialisation of the company's climate take-back initiative to run its businesses in a way that reverses the effects of global warming to become a carbon negative company by 2040. A chemical engineer with lean skills, Aidan leads local innovation projects to reduce waste, embody carbon and to continue development of the company's circular economy model. Welcome to the program, Aidan. Yeah, thanks, Anthea. Nice to be here. Aidan, Interface has a strong history of innovation in sustainability. Can you share the story for our listeners, please? Yeah, Interface is um, basically a global company. We're a company who basically are a worldwide leader in design, production, sales of commercial flooring, such as carpet tile, luxury vinyl tile, and rubber tiles and sheet products. And we basically were incorporated back in 1973. But uh, 21 years after that, in 1994, uh, we had what we call a, a mid-course correction when our uh, CEO and founder, Ray Anderson, was asked about what he was doing for the environment. And his simple answer was, we're compliant. Uh, and that certainly wasn't good enough for the client that asked that question. Uh, and we actually lost that uh, order. And Ray Anderson decided then to see what he should be doing about the environment and put together a task force to address the issue. And of course, they asked him for a mission statement or a vision, what the vision of success might be. And uh, and Ray didn't have a vision. And it was only when he was a book was placed on his uh, desk, The Ecology of Commerce by Paul Hawken, that when Ray read that book and read about basically the death of birth, extinction of species, you know, how we were actually plundering the resources of the earth that we're not we'd be able to replenish. Uh, so effectively, uh, it was a take make waste model that he had been operating as a business model for those 21 years. And it had a very emotional effect on him. He had a, a, a what he called a spear in the chest epiphany. And uh, the more he read Paul Hawkins' book, he said that deeper that spear went into his chest. And basically, when he finished, he decided he was going to have to change uh, how he ran his business. And that's when he set on the whole initiative called Mission Zero to reduce the company's environmental impacts to zero by 2020. And that was, what, 29 years ago. Basically, Ray has uh, had turned the company around. Uh, and with progress, we've become effectively a sustainability leader within the industry and globally recognised for that as well. And certainly that bodes well with your own background because you yourself came from an early background of sustainability as well, didn't you? Yeah, well, interestingly enough, uh, uh, as a chemical engineer, I, I started my career in the petrochemical industry. And now... I've probably turned full circle like interface myself. Petrochemicals supplied the materials, the raw materials for carpet manufacture back in the day when Ray started his company. Uh, and having read the Paul Hawken book, Ray's ultimate goal was to cut that link to petrochemicals, to fossil fuels, uh, to take materials that were already extracted and then using renewable energy, manufacture and remanufacture over and over, hence reducing the input or the impact of, of, of his uh, business operations. So for me, starting off in a petrochemical industry was a bit ironic. I then moved into phytomedicines, which is basically extracting medicinal compounds from uh, naturally occurring materials like roots, seeds, bark, leaf. And then from there, when I uh, came to Australia back in 2003, I joined Interface uh, to become their sustainability manager. And been doing some great work ever since. So just going back to the inspiration for Interface to create a path toward a more sustainable space through the product range. 1994, they made a significant start and you've been managing the footprint since 1996. So what can you tell us about that journey now? Well, I think importantly, the first thing we realised when we decided to go on this journey towards Mission Zero, we would actually have to measure progress and you cannot manage what you can't measure. 
So uh, what we did basically in 1996 was set up what we called our Ecometrics. And our Ecometrics was about measuring every kilo of waste we produced, every kilo of raw material we used, you know, every kilowatt hour of electricity, recycled content, gas, energy use. So we were basically tracking uh, our performance over that time. Uh, and those measurements allowed us to focus on areas where we really need to uh, pay attention and to reduce our impacts. And, and initially, it was about the numbers. It was really about benchmarking and seeing where we were. And measurement system coupled with a roadmap, coupled with a target, came together very beautifully under the Mission Zero initiative. Uh, and when I talk about a roadmap, we didn't find that there's one silver bullet that was going to get us there. Effectively, we had to look at diverting waste from landfill, reducing the waste we produced, removing materials that would have been hazardous to life or the environment, introducing renewable energy to all our manufacturing facilities, and ultimately then developing this first circular economy model really for the flooring business, where we would take back our product at the end of life and remanufacture that into new product. And in addition to that, we had a focus as well on the transport facilities we used, you know, influence within the industry as well to drive our, our, our initiative. And all those came together to give us really substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions from our factories, reducing the carbon footprint of our product, uh, and effectively cutting that link to the petrochemicals, which was the ultimate goal, to remove those fossil fuels from the manufacturing processes for our carpet and our flooring. A very important tool in achieving our ultimate goals of reducing our impacts is effectively life cycle assessment. So we use the tool of life cycle assessment really back in the mid 2000s to identify where the major impacts were. And we could see that 60 to 70 percent of our impacts were within our supply chain in the raw materials we were using. Uh, and using life cycle assessment, we could see what the impacts our factories were having, what the impacts the transport was having, and even the impact of the material of our products on the floor. Interestingly, about 20% of our carbon footprint today is a result of the cleaning and maintenance of the product. So doing life cycle assessment allowed us to identify where the issues were. And then we decided we would actually develop our one of the first, the first, I think, environmental product declaration for a flooring company in the US back in 2009. Uh, and the environmental product declaration was effectively a published document which quantifiably demonstrated the environmental impacts of our product. In other words, what was the global warming potential, kilos of carbon dioxide per meter squared, abiotic depletion, eutrophication. These were all environmental impacts that were scientifically modeled through life cycle assessment and then published and third party verified. And that EPD allowed us to, to basically say, these are the impacts our business is having, our products are having on the environment. And we can use this then to identify the areas for reduction and improvement. So creating the first EPD for the sector was quite a game changer. Why is that so? Effectively, creating that first EPD allowed us to identify where the major issues were with regard to effectively our environmental footprint of our products. So we could actually dive in there and identify that effectively 60-70% of our global warming potential associated with our products, for instance, was associated with the raw materials we use. So that allowed us then to start working with our suppliers to reduce the footprint of their products and therefore enable us to reduce the footprint of ours. And in identify other areas for significant change, we could actually look at those materials, we could actually reimagine the product that we were manufacturing and replace the materials that we used initially, a lot of them petrochemical based, and then drive towards a higher recycle content, higher bio-based content to effectively reduce that carbon footprint. So the environmental product declaration is probably the most important tool to guide us on our journey towards mission zero and effectively beyond that, because our ultimate goal is to become a carbon negative company by 2040. So when we actually produced our first environmental product declaration, the important point about doing that was that it would allow us to quantifiably demonstrate the environmental impacts of our product. The ultimate goal of that then is to compare our product with other products. So effectively, an EPD is basically scientifically modeled and third party verified. And what an EPD does for a manufacturer is it avoids greenwash. It allows the manufacturer to say, 
These are the environmental impacts of our product, good, better, or best. doesn't matter. But if you, as a consumer, want to pick a product, you don't have to rely on declarations like this product is 100% renewable or this product is recyclable. You look at the EPD and you compare one EPD for one product with the EPD for another product. And that allows apples with apples comparisons. It avoids that greenwash. So effectively, the EPD is a snapshot in time. It says these are the environmental impacts of this product. And that again, as I said earlier, allows the client to compare one with the other. And this has been very, very good for us in that it has allowed us to get a lot of market share by having really low carbon footprint flooring. So let's just unpack that a little more. Resilience and sustainability are key elements of the product. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, absolutely. When we talk about our flooring and we talk about resilience, we're really talking about fit for purpose, uh, products that are warranted for long life. And really where that is key an element to sustainability is that those materials have a lower impact over a longer period of time. And ultimately, at the end of their first life, we can either look at reuse because of that extended warranty or remanufacturing them back into new products. So when we talk about resilience and sustainability, they're effectively the same thing. It's about long lasting materials and materials that can be used over. Are you looking for a digitalization and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and net zero journey. Visit VinZero.com to find out more. What is it that makes the interface product so long lasting? Well, the long lasting really comes from the selection of materials. And there's three elements we use when we select the materials in our product. We look at green chemistry to make sure that they're safe for human health and environmental health. We look at embodied carbon, and this is key because it's important that we have very low embodied carbon materials. And thirdly, we look at materials that have circularity in their manufacture, that they can be reused over and over or recycled. So when you take those three elements, that means you can then select materials to produce a product that is fit for purpose and fit for climate, and that it can be actually disassembled at the end of life and remanufactured back into new products. And this is the ultimate goal with a really true circular economy model. And that's also obviously what allows the products to be carbon neutral for their full product life cycle. Well, carbon neutral is a, is a different element. The first and foremost thing you should really be doing with your products is reducing the carbon footprint. And so first of all, you measure, as we did when we kicked off back in 1996, benchmark that footprint. Then we looked at ways of reducing that carbon impact through higher recycle content, renewable energy, even a less is more approach, less material, less impact. And as a result of that, we've reduced our emissions by what? 76% over the 20 odd years that we've been measuring. And as a result of that, then we have a small remaining residual carbon footprint, which we need to offset uh, or mitigate through the purchase of carbon credits. And that means that we can actually make all our products carbon neutral. And we've been doing that since 2018. All our products across the full life cycle are 100% carbon neutral. So, Aidan, the flooring products for Interface are carbon neutral for their full product life cycle. How has this been achieved? Well, initially, our flooring products, as I said earlier, we, we measured their footprint. So we were able to benchmark what the emissions were associated across each stage of the product's life cycle. And in the early days, we did some carbon offsetting back in 2000, where we actually provide carbon neutral products on a project per project basis, depending on the client's requirement. Our ultimate goal was to reduce that carbon footprint, because this is key. If you're going to address climate change and the impacts we have on our environment, we must reduce the carbon footprint. And to do that, we actually reimagined the product. We changed the materials that we were using within the product to look for low carbon raw materials. We introduced renewable energy into all our manufacturing facilities. And we approach the less is more approach, less material, less impact. 
And then over time, through our re-entry process, taking products back at the end of life and remanufacturing, we were able to increase the recycled and bio-based content within those products as well. And that effectively meant we were reducing that dependency on petrochemicals over the last 29 years. As a result, we've achieved a 76% reduction in carbon footprint for our products. And when you can get that far, then making all your products carbon neutral is so much easier. Part of the interface approach to date has been the inclusion of carbon offsetting. How is it that interface have chosen their offsets? That's a good question, Anthea. And I think we should probably say initially that the ultimate goal here is to reduce your emissions to zero and then go beyond. Carbon offsetting, to get to carbon neutrality, whether it's your carbon neutral products or as a carbon neutral enterprise, which we achieved back in 2021, uh, was through the purchase of carbon credits. And as you journey towards reducing emissions, the point would be that you actually purchase carbon credits to mitigate those remaining emissions. So this can be a murky area, and we have seen a lot of issues around offsetting and, and offsetting claims and carbon neutral claims. For interface, there are two things we need to look at. First of all, that the offsets we choose are high integrity and low risk. In other words, they're doing what they say on the label. They're not, if we have one ton of carbon emissions, the offset that we are choosing must mitigate that by either avoiding the emissions or sequestering one ton of emissions. So we actually hold a portfolio of our offsets, a diverse range of offsets, and they're global. We're a global company. Carbon uh, doesn't uh, know any international barriers. So purchasing an offset in, in Europe or in Asia or in the USA or here in Australia makes no difference. It's still a ton of carbon sequestered. For us, it is key that the offsets are additional. As I said earlier, they do what they're saying on the label that they're measurable, that they are uh, verifiable. In other words, that we can actually say that this is real. And of course, also that they are permanent. So if that carbon is drawn down, it is a permanent offset. And, if, and actually, last but not least, I think they need to be ethical. We have to ensure there are no unintended environmental or social consequences of purchasing those offsets. So we actually look at them very, very carefully, and we ensure that those offsets that we purchase are verified to a global standard, to a high standard. In other words, that there's high integrity. And we use Gold Star, VCS. These are the type of global standards that we would use to test and ensure that our offsets are high quality. So that's a phenomenal achievement. Where to next for Interface? Well, interestingly, as we got towards our Mission Zero target date 2020, and we were celebrating success back in 2019, we were asking ourselves, what's the next big initiative we should be taking? And everyone within the company felt that it should be to address climate change, effectively take climate back. And there's three things that we focused on. One, that climate is real. Two, we have caused it. Uh, we as an industry have caused it. We as a human race have caused it. And three, we can change it back. And our climate take back initiative is just that. Our ultimate goal now is to move beyond mission zero where doing no harm is fine, to have zero impact on your environment, but to get to a stage where you become a restorative enterprise, where you actually are sequestering more carbon from our atmosphere than ex putting out uh, in our manufacturing processes. And our ultimate goal is to be carbon negative by 2040. So Interface are officially the first and only flooring manufacturer to achieve this carbon neutral enterprise certification past 2060, which is the first milestone on the way to being a carbon zero enterprise. As a first mover in that regard, what do you think needs to happen for this to become a standard across the industry? Well, first and foremost, uh, becoming a carbon neutral enterprise was for us a step, not a very big step, going from carbon neutral products to become a carbon neutral enterprise. To get to becoming a carbon neutral enterprise, we really had to look at our emissions, you know, right across the range, not just scope one and scope two, which is the energy that we use to drive our businesses, but also scope three emissions, those emissions associated with our supply chain. And this is what's really difficult, actually calculating and estimating, finding out where those emissions come from to be able to do something about it. 
So Interface became a carbon neutral enterprise in 2021. Uh, and we decided to do that because having all our products carbon neutral meant that you know we had mitigated 85% of emissions for the enterprise. That remaining 15% we had to address. Uh, and we really had to jump into our scope three emissions to do that. So looking at scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions for our business, we have mitigated all those emissions through the purchase of offsets. And we've done that to the past 2060 standard. You can do it also here in Australia to a climate active standard. And I think it is a, a, a real point of difference and that is showing the leadership to go towards becoming a zero emitter. I think by becoming a carbon neutral enterprise, we have actually set a goal for the industry. And our clients will expect this as we go further. A lot of companies, cities, um, businesses within the built environment all have 2030 goals and ultimately they are carbon neutral goals, net zero goals. So we've just got out there ahead of the posse and done it first. And I can see that this will actually drive uh, the take up of carbon neutrality uh, and a journey towards net zero buildings by 2030. And we'll be supported in this by Green Building Council of Australia, neighbours. There's a lot of companies and organisations driving the agenda for net zero. And so, Aidan, Interface is certainly demonstrating leadership in all aspects. So you're committed to innovation. What's next? Well, ultimately for us, as I said, our goal is to become a carbon negative enterprise by 2040. In other words, to become a restorative uh, enterprise. Uh, net zero uh, sounds great, but it is actually only a milestone towards reducing our emissions. Ultimately, the goal here has to be to reduce our emissions, to stop emitting and to start drawing down that carbon. If we're seriously thinking about addressing climate change. So for us, our next goal, and we've started already, is to produce carbon negative products to again reimagine the materials that we're using in our products and develop an innovative processes with renewable energy to actually become carbon negative. So we're looking now at using higher recycled content, but also bio-based content. You're looking at what nature can provide and using some smart industrial chemistry to convert natural products uh, into raw materials that we can use in our, in our flooring. And we've done that over the years by experimenting with um, bamboo to produce nylon yarn, corn starch to produce nylon yarn, even castor bean oil. These are naturally occurring materials that we can actually use to sequester carbon and then implement those into our products. So it sounds like there's certainly more exciting times ahead for Interface and it's not the end of the story. When you think future about the industry and about what Interface have to offer, what is it that excites you the most? I think what excites me the most is that we have problems to solve and we have had really great success in the past and we feel that we're actually going to make a positive impact. We can actually address those problems and with the people that we have within the company, the culture within our company is just keyed towards solving the problems with respect to climate change. You know, we always said that sustainability was in our DNA, but what we've come to realize is that, you know, it's within everyone's DNA. And the exciting thing for me is to see new people coming into Interface, joining the company, uh, picking up the baton and running with it to achieve those goals. But I do feel that there's a real energy within the company that will help us achieve that. And I don't think there's any problem that will not be solved and there will be technologies we're going to be using that may be even back to the future. There might have been the old technologies that we've dropped, but we will actually continue to be innovative. We will continue to drive towards better products, better design, less waste and less climate impact. I think that's a really, for me, it's, it's important. We were changing effectively a business imperative or a moral imperative on climate to a business imperative. And I think we're going to succeed in that. Well, Adam, we certainly look forward to continuing to put a spotlight on Interface and its innovations as you head towards a more sustainable future for industry. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you very much for uh, having me along this morning. Cheers, Anthea. This podcast was brought to you by VinZero. VinZero helped the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change. 
and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. Finzero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our Vinzero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcast at vinzero.com or from your favourite podcast platform. From Vinzero Think Future, thanks for listening.